first of all, I just want to thank you all for coming. You know, I know you've come a long way and I really appreciate it. Um, earlier today, we had a Christian ceremony for dad. Um, earlier this week, we had the Buddhist ceremony at the cremation site and really, you know, everything has been you just so, everything's been absolutely beautiful. You know, the speakers, the hosts, everybody's just been so loving to me and my family. Um, but, you know, for me, um, this has provided a lot of closure for my dad's friends, his co-workers, and like my Thai family. Um, but for my American family, I feel like there's still a lot left to be said in the English language. And I just want to be certain that the essence of, of like my father's character is just not lost in translation. So anyways, that's, that's why I invited you here today. So um, look, I know what you're thinking. Dad lived 83 years old, so this is about to be a long story, but I promise I've, I've kept it down to about 20 minutes, okay? So just please don't fall asleep. And, um, and yeah, make sure you got a, a glass or something to drink, because I'd like to have or finish this with just one last toast. Um, so yeah, please don't finish your drinks just yet. Yeah, I'm talking to you there, Rocky. All right. <laughs> Sip slow. <laughs> Save a little bit for the end. We'll throw it back together. <laughs> and uh, I mean, we got to have, I think, at least one little ceremony here with alcohol. I mean, it would be unacceptable to my American brothers if we did at least, you know, do one right, you know, do one proper here. We got to pour out a little liquor, I think, for dad. So uh, <laughs> So anyways, let's do this one proper. And, um, and really, I think my hope is I, j I just want to have fun. And um, I just want to share some laughs and uh, you know, maybe even cry. But you know, most of all, I just want to make sure that you know, my dad's story could positively impact your life in just maybe one way or another. All right? So, uh, so let's get settled. Let's, let's get set up. And, uh, and we'll get started, OK? I want to take you through a journey, and I want to tell you about the life and times of my dad, Dr. Seth Pascon. Now, back home, we called him Papa. You know, this was his name in the house, Papa. And I grew up watching Bugs Bunny, so, you know, every morning for me was like, hey, what's up, Doc? I, I would call him Papa Doc, even to last week. You know, that's how dad was known to us. Um, and like all great stories, Dad starts from very, very humble beginnings. Um, so Dad was born in Utong, Supanburi, 1939. And he was the eldest son of 12 siblings. So, you know, my grandparents, they had a lumber shop in Utong. That was the family business. It still stands to this day. You know, where I come from in the States, they would call a place like Utong like a one-horse town. You know, Shane, but yeah, I guess in Thailand, they call this place like a one elephant town, okay? A really small place. And, you know, my grandfather would cut timber in the forest and have elephants drag it back to the shop where men with hand saws and hand tools would just chop it up to size. You know, that's how they got by. That's how my grandparents supported their children. And to hear my dad tell it, he would tell me stories about walking five kilometers to school every day through dirt roads and like rough terrain. On the weekends, he would collect pig's blood from the next door neighbor and go sell it in the market for some extra change, making some extra scratch on the weekends. <laughs> this was my dad's childhood, you know? Um, and believe it or not, actually dad, dad was a lefty. He wrote left-handed. But my grandfather forced him to learn how to write with his right hand. Because back then it was more noble. It was more socially accepted. And now I finally realize this is why his doctor orders have been so hard to read all these years. Dad was writing with the wrong hand all this time. <laughs> his nurses would be like, what's he writing here? This is paracetamol. This is penicillin. I don't know. You're right? Um, but now it all makes sense. <laughs> but really, you know, dad, he just proved to be quite smart 
and dad progress faster than the other children his age. And, you know, by the time he was 14, he eventually moved away from home. He left home at the age of 14 to go live with strangers in Bangkok, pursue a higher education. And once again, dad just proved to be quite intelligent and he eventually graduated as a doctor of medicine from Siri Lat Hospital, Mahidon University. And you know, for those of you who don't know, um, Siri Lat is Thailand's first medical school. It still stands today on the Jao Paya River there in Bangkok. And um, this year they'll graduate class number 125 and dad graduated class number 71. Now, this was during the time of the Vietnam War back when the U.S. was developing great relations with the Kingdom of Thailand. And a lot of the U.S.-based doctors, they were busy taking care of casualties of war. They were servicing the war. So when small local communities in rural areas, there was a shortage of doctors. So the U.S. eventually gave an opportunity to foreign doctors like my dad to come to America, work and study, and, but the only requirement, okay, the only requirement was you had to pass the U.S. medical physician's exam. All right, you had to pass this exam. And, um, you know, dad told me there were 2,000 doctors that applied. Thai doctors applied to do this. They only accepted 700 though. And, you know, this is a story that, you know, dad has told me probably countless times, you know, it, it, Back in the day, I used to think maybe dad has a little Alzheimer's. He's told me this story too many times. He just repeats it all the time. <laughs> but I just remember this story so clearly because he told me they posted the test results on the wall. All 2,000 applicants in the order of acceptance. One through 700, you're accepted. 701 to 2,000, you're, you know, you're gonna have to try again. So, you know, it, but the way dad told it, he said I was too timid to check from number one. He's like, I went and checked from 2,000. So dad started at 2000, he said he didn't find his name. Next to last, he didn't find his name, so that's a win. <laughs> checked through the 2000s, checked through the 1000s, got to 700, he said, I'm starting to feel good. He's like, I'm starting to get excited, I might have made the cut, I haven't found my name yet. You know, he starts looking through the, the fives and the threes, 200s, 100s, and he's like, I, at this point, he's like, I'm starting to feel a little scared. Still didn't find my name, you know, maybe they, lost my paper when they picked up the stack, or maybe I, I forgot to write my name on the top. You know, he's thinking all this, but no, eventually dad found his name. Dad was at placement number 36. Yeah, and that is how dad punched his ticket to the United States. Yeah, so, you know, he started out in New Jersey, went to Philadelphia, and then New York. And eventually he finished his American medical education with two specialties. Yeah, not just one, two, in internal medicine and pediatrics. When the war was over in the U.S. at this time, dad had to make a decision. You know, was he going to return to Thailand? You know, return maybe to Utong, Supanburi, where they just got electricity? They just got some indoor plumbing? <laughs> Or would he stay in America and join a program called Rural Healthcare? This was a program the US government made for foreign doctors like my dad to open a medical clinic in a rural area, an underserved community. They gave special incentives for them to open a clinic in an underserved community just to help the American people. And so that's what dad did. And so he decided to stay in the US and as if he, he just closed his eyes and just pointed on the map, he eventually landed in a place called Salem, Missouri. That's where dad ended up landing and that's where dad, you know, eventually built his career and built his house and like raised his family, it was in Salem, Missouri. Now, my mom, being the most beautiful, bombshell Miss Merry Christmas that she is, <laughs> was a nurse. And she worked with dad up until the point where dad just couldn't stand it anymore, the temptations, he had to propose. And so they were married in 1985. 
make sure I get this date right. And you know, my two brothers and I, we just grew up running around the medical clinic, you know, mom chasing after us, spoiling us with everything you can think of. You know, believe it or not, I grew up as the fat kid. Sonny, I was the fat kid in school growing up, elementary school. Between my mom's like home cooking, my dad's famous barbecue chicken, every time I was bending my elbows, I was eating. There's just no other way to explain it. I was a fat kid. And, um, you know, if any of you are wondering, like, what does a silver spoon raised child look like? It's this guy right here, okay? I'm pretty much the definition of a privileged child, American child. And, um, you know, unlike dad's childhood, collecting blood and all that, you know, my childhood had very difficult decisions to make. Every day, I had to decide whether I should go for a swim in the heated indoor pool with a retractable roof, or, or maybe get in the go-kart, take the paddle boat out, go fishing in one of these three lakes. <laughs> you know, dad built a custom adult-sized playground with a swing set. <laughs> we had dogs and cats, a Malukan cockatoo bird as a pet, fresh vegetable gardens, exotic fruit trees you could just walk up and just eat off of. You know, color TVs in every room of the house, Shane. You know what I'm saying? Peace song, please believe I was the first to have a computer running Windows 95 at seven years of age. You know, my family wanted for nothing. You know, dad was just truly blessed and he worked tirelessly to give me and my family the greatest lifestyle you could ever imagine, truly. And, you know, on top of that, dad was also helping his Thai siblings get established in the United States. My youngest aunt, she was a pharmacist, studied in Rhode Island. My oldest uncle, an engineer, another uncle, computer science. Dad helped get his mother a U.S. green card so she could visit between Thailand and the United States to visit her children. I mean, dad was the bridge between worlds. And, you know, my family's fairy tale life was his greatest accomplishment, truly his greatest accomplishment in life. But you know, <clears throat> like, like all great stories, dad's story also had great tragedy. And, you know, even today, actually, even today, we read headlines and we see news reports about big pharma and the opioid crisis that plagues America. See, back in the 90s and back in the early 2000s, the government was actually targeting individual doctors like my dad. And you see, on paper, Opening a medical clinic in an underserved community, a rural area, this sounds very noble. This sounds very righteous. You know, and that's the rural health care program dad signed up for. But, you know, in actuality, these communities and these neighborhoods are the most dangerous and the most untrustworthy. And it's you know, dad had the highest levels of American medical education. But there's just no form of training that can teach you how to read between the lines and with deception. And especially when there's cultural differences and language barriers, secondary languages. And so, you know, in America, you can treat thousands of patients successfully, but it really only takes one patient to ruin a reputation. And in my dad's case, it was two patients and they decided to investigate. So they decided to investigate dad. Now, as a matter of fact, the initial committee board, they actually ruled 
that Dr. Pascon established himself as a caring physician who treated Medicaid patients with serious conditions that other doctors would not treat. So they decided to never discipline him and they found no reason to continue the investigation. But the district attorney's office felt differently and they decided to pursue Dr. Pascon and have their day in court. This was a long drawn out process, but you know, eventually when the verdict was determined, Dr. Pascon had to close his medical clinic after 45 years and he surrendered his medical license for five years. So, you know, this, this event is what kind of broke my family's fairy tale life. And, you know, this was a dark time in my family's history. I was 19 years of age at the time, but, you know, I was the youngest son. Me and my brothers, we had to figure out how to make it on our own. And, you know, my mom, she ended up losing the house that we call the home. And after 45 years in the U.S., dad returned to Thailand with two pieces of luggage and $700 in his pocket. He went from the highest of the highs to the lowest of the lows. And you know, you may think to yourself that starting over at the age of 70 seems impossible, <laughs> but to my dad, it was a challenge, a challenge that he welcomed and you know, it was in these times, it was in the dark times that Seth Pascon would put on his cape and become the Superman hero that I know and that I love. And within the five years after returning back to Thailand, he helped open the International Hospital in Mesot. That's on the border of Myanmar. Once again, treating patients in underserved communities. The next five years after that, dad had got it all back. Got it back his dignity, his security, and plenty of more to share with me and my family. Dr. Pascon knew how to survive, and he had the heart to keep fighting even when he was down. And to some, it may have been easier to have just rolled over and died after going through what dad went through late in life, but no, dad never gave up. And dad held his head high and he was still able to provide for his family. And, and really looking back in the grand scheme of things, dad only suffered a minor setback but he made a major comeback. And you know, for me, it's the comeback story. It's the comeback story that really defined my dad's character late in life. And, and it's really a testament that I hope we all can take away from his passing. And you know, I may not have told you all this. I may not have told you all this as my friends, but exactly seven years ago to this month is when I came to Thailand to get my citizenship. I just planned a short trip. And, you know, back then, me and dad were just hanging out more as brothers instead of father and son. It was a great time. And, you know, as if it was scripted, dad planned to drive me to the airport on my departure. But that morning of my departure, dad suffered a heart attack. Said his chest was tight, short of breath. You know, back then I didn't know how to call an ambulance. I didn't even, really I didn't have time for an ambulance. And I ended up driving dad to the hospital myself without a Thai driver's license. <laughs> but I remember this because it's the first time in my life I ever dealt with an emergency life or death emergency, first time in my life. And I just remember when we arrived at the emergency room, 
dad turned into Dr. Pascon, and he immediately started barking orders. <laughs> he started ordering all these nurses in the ER. He ordered oxygen, give me an EKG, I need all these other things, and, he, and he, all these nurses are running around the ER getting dad set up. And me, I'm just standing in the corner in shock <laughs> as I'm watching dad diagnose his own heart attack. <laughs> Gosh, this whole scene, should, it should have been a scene in a movie, you know, thinking about it. That's how it plays in my head. And, um, and, you know, it was that day in the waiting room that I just decided to stay in Thailand indefinitely and, you know, help dad recover. But, you know, my short trip turned into one year and, you know, one year turned into three. And, you know, here we are now at year seven. So, you know, there was a time when I felt regretful, just leaving my American life behind. But as I stand here now today, I'm really proud that I stayed just for this specific moment that you're sharing with me right now. So, you know, I decided just to make the best out of my situation. I mean, that's, what, that's the example dad set for me make the best out of your situation. And that's what I did. And, you know, with a lot of luck, I was just able to find a job and a career in medical tourism. You know, that's how some of you guys know me here today. And, um, you know, <clears throat> but the highlight of my career so far is the first patient me and dad actually worked on together. Her name was Pauline. Now, Mrs. Pauline was from New Zealand. She flew into Thailand for life-changing surgery. And I took care of Mrs. Pauline from arrival until departure. But in between times, Pauline had a blood pressure problem. You know, we had to get her blood pressure down before we could do surgery. So the surgeon I worked for referred Pauline to a doctor of internal medicine, my dad, at Akechon Hospital, Bang San Chonburi. And please believe that day, I was just so, you know, proud to escort Miss Pauline into dad's consultation room. So proud. I was walking, I was walking past dad's nurses, like step aside, youngest son's coming through here, got a VIP, foreign patient, okay? Move out the way. So proud, and, and I brought Mrs. Pauline to see my dad, and you know, dad was old school, okay? Pops was old school, he used stethoscopes. You know, those necklaces that got the earplugs and the little compass thing, you know? That's what dad did. You know, dad, he didn't stare at a computer and ask Pauline questions out the side of his eye, okay? This wasn't dad style. Dad used pen and paper, <laughs> and dad took his time, and dad talked to Pauline, and I was able to stand by his side as he was writing the treatment orders. And, you know, this was the first and the only time me and dad's professional careers ever crossed paths, um, but to now, that experience just means everything to me. Dad actually treated his last patient in March of this year, 2022, at 83 years of age. It goes without saying that dad's greatest passion in life was just being a doctor. But after March, dad was no longer the doctor anymore dad was now the patient and it feels like you know since then our roles have kind of reversed the father and son roles seem to seem to have switched like my innocent child I had to start bribing dad to be a good patient you know to follow up regularly get your meds right and so every hospital visit ended with the thing dad loved most, fresh fruit. <laughs> so every time we would finish the hospital, we would 
share some watermelon or some papaya, some red grapes, not the green ones. Okay, got to be the red ones with no seeds. And of course, durian, you know, because now it's in season. You know, in the end, it's really um, the simple things that bring us comfort, like hanging out in a car and sharing a piece of fruit together, or, you know, flipping through some photo albums of good times that have come to pass. And in my dad's final moments, there was no pain and there was no struggle. There was just silence. And it's really my hope that we can all pass in the same manner, peacefully, like dad did. And, you know, like my dad, we got to live now and we got to live boldly and we got to keep fighting through life's obstacles because someone else is watching. And the example dad set, his legacy, it'll stay with me for an eternity. You know, I mean, I, I can only hope to amount to be a, a fraction of what dad became. And I mean, ultimately, I'm just grateful that he's given me a chance to try. And, you know, I, I really want to sincerely thank you all for giving me an audience and an opportunity to just express my sincere thoughts. And, um, you know, right now I just feel like everything I needed to say, it's, it's been said. And I finally feel content uh, to let go. So, so if you would, please, now, let's raise a glass. And let's give one last toast to Dr. Pascon, my hero and my father. Rest in peace, Papa. Thank you all.